Well, hello, good morning, and good afternoon, depending on where you are joining us from. Thank you so much for joining us for Contracting Procurement Supplier Diversity, uh, a conversation around an important research project that was started of the Public Private Strategies Institute. Uh, for those of you I don't know, my name is Rep Buttle. I am proud to serve as president of the Public Private Strategies Institute. We're an organization that seeks to bring the public and private sector together to solve some of society's most pressing issues. Uh, as part of uh, PPSI, which is what we call ourselves for short, we run a number of initiatives. Uh, and today I'm so proud uh, to stand with our leaders in our Reimagine Main Street initiative, which is a coalition of so many of our partners from diverse chambers, economic development organizations, and business leaders across the country, who really started out of COVID-19 to make sure that Main Street not only built back after the pandemic, but that it built back better. Uh, and in the years since, it's taken the leading edge on bringing people together, advocating for public policy solutions, uh, and mostly, and, and perhaps most importantly, developing critical insights and research by taking polling businesses and um, cutting it by race and ethnicity so that we can make sure that the solutions that we're creating, not only in the public sector for public policy, but also in the private sector, have the best data available to make sure that we're creating an economy that really works for everyone and works for main streets and business owners of color all across the country. Today, my job is to tell you a little bit about who we are, but I also want to take a moment to thank all of our incredible partners. One of the most amazing things about today's conversation is we had over 15 national organizations come together and really work together to put this uh, research project together. It's an unprecedented amount of organizations that have come to work on a procurement project. So I just want to thank all of the amazing leaders who are A, joining us today. You're going to hear from some of them, but B, not all of them were able to join us today. You see their logos up on the screen. Today would not be possible without them, but this piece of research is a critical piece of research that is going to shape public policy. It's going to shape markets. Uh, and it's a critical step forward for a very important uh, topic, which is procurement. Uh, and with that, the last thing that I get to do before I turn it over to the experts uh, is get the pleasure of turning it over to our keynote uh, speaker, uh, Congressman Joaquin Castro, who is an amazing leader in Congress. Not only is he fighting for his district in San Antonio, he's been an amazing leader in Texas, uh, but he understands this issue inside and out. And not only is he bringing this issue to the national stage as his perch, as his uh, as a congressman and raising these issues with the administration and other policymakers, uh, but he's uh, pu putting his uh, money where his mouth is, and he has worked really hard in his district, partnering with critical partners like the Aspen Latinos and Society Program and Drexel Institute uh, to really make sure procurement uh, in his district uh, is a live model for those of us who really care about these issues and know how important it is to the lifeblood of our economies. So with that, let me be quiet and turn it over to our opening speaker, Congressman Joaquin Castro. Congressman, over to you. Well, uh, thank you so much, Red, for that wonderful introduction and for all of your work at the Public Private Strategies Institute and for this conversation on procurement, contracting, and supplier diversity. Uh, I'm Joaquin Castro, and I have the great honor of representing the place where I grew up, my hometown of San Antonio, Texas, the seventh largest city in the nation. And I am in my sixth term in the United States Congress and in my 22nd year of public service. And I want to explain a little bit about how I came to really get engaged on this issue about uh, three or four years ago now uh, and why it matters so much to me and why I think it should matter, it should matter so much to all of us uh, and policymakers, as well as those in administrations in the executive branch, whether it's in the federal executive branch at the White House, Department of Commerce, SBA, or in each of our respective states. Uh, I grew up on the west side of San Antonio, which is an area that's probably in many places 95%, mostly Mexican American, but Latino. And uh, over the years, uh, I grew up in a family that was very active in politics and grassroots politics in really working towards change for more inclusion in the political system, particularly of Latinos, but for others as well, minorities, uh, you know, of different backgrounds. And, but I noticed something over the years, even as I was in public service, I worked on so many important issues. I think that all of us, regardless of our politics, would consider important education, healthcare, uh, different kinds of job creation, just a lot of various things. But there was something that has always disturbed me about my hometown. There were a lot of things that we're proud of, uh, but one of the things that we kept getting marked by was this constant classification as being one of the most economically segregated cities and one of the most economically uneven cities in the country. And I watched for a few years, you know, every year this statistic would come up where we were either the worst 
or one of the worst in the country. And I really started to try to dig in uh, to what causes it, what creates that. Uh, because it had been by that time years that I believed that I was doing work to try to fix those things. Uh, and I think the issues that I mentioned before are part of fixing that, building what I call an infrastructure of opportunity for people so that they can pursue their American dreams. But I thought, you know, there are a few pieces, a few angles on this that I, I haven't taken uh, as much time on and I think are incredibly important. So in early 2021, I asked my staff to request of all of the public agencies in San Antonio. So the Bear County, the city, the Port Authority, uh, the Housing Authority, so forth, uh, their numbers with regard to contracting and procurement. And it took about two months for all the agencies to get me back all the information. And we put it all into a spreadsheet. And these were not our numbers. These were their numbers in response to what we asked for. And just to give you some context, for those of you that may not be familiar with San Antonio, it's a fairly diverse city. It's about 64% Latino, about 6 or 7% African American, now probably about 3 or 4% Asian American. Uh, of course, a strong LGBTQ community, a strong veterans community, because it's known as Military City USA. And the numbers that I got back uh, were extremely disappointing. I'm gonna take the Latino number for a second. I represent a district that's about 68% Latino uh, with a lot of folks in their communities that have been marginalized over the years. So the city is 64% Latino. The best performing agency of all those public agencies with respect to contracting with Latino businesses was a city of San Antonio that contracted 32% of its dollars the year before with Latino businesses. Uh, the worst performing agency and I won't, I won't name them just now to be courteous, but the worst performing agency uh, in a city that was 64% Latino was marked at 3% contracting with Latino firms and Latina firms. So you can see, and by the way, the numbers for African-Americans were well below their six or 7% of the population. Same thing even with Asian-Americans uh, and other groups as well. So you can see how uh, a city would get marked uh, as one of the most economically segregated cities and uneven cities in the nation with numbers like that. So I decided at that point that I really wanted to engage on this issue. And it was something that I took on as a kind of special project in my office. In other words, you know, the, in Congress, there's kind of two pieces, two basic pieces to the job. Uh, the first piece is the legislation that you vote on every day and the legislation that you propose. The other part is constituent services. When somebody picks up the phone and calls you because they need help with VA benefits or the IRS, you do everything you can to help them. So this was outside of that, but I took it on because I believe that it's part of building out that infrastructure of opportunity for our folks in San Antonio. And so this is what we did. So I got with the Aspen Institute and uh, uh, Dominica Lynch over at the Aspen Latinos and Bruce Katz at Drexel University. And they were able to raise about $150,000 to come up with a procurement playbook and also to, to convene 14 heads of public agencies in San Antonio to discuss this very issue. Never before, I think, perhaps in the city's history and the county's history, had all 14 CEOs of those public agencies been in the same room to discuss probably any issue uh, if it happened before, it probably happened by accident, but they were here to discuss procurement, contracting, uh, supplier diversity, and how they could do better. And this procurement, procurement playbook uh, was going to be a roadmap for them to start to become uh, agencies that were easier to place a bid with, that helped build up the capacity of firms that were looking to bid with those agencies, that were streamlining processes to make it easier for small businesses uh, to bid with the agencies. They were becoming more transparent as well, also in an effort to make it easier and to better measure where each of the agencies was and where they're headed. So those 14 CEOs have now met three or four times in person and have created subcommittees to carry out this procurement playbook. And I did a few other things. 
I also got, because Congress, as y'all know, a few years ago, uh, readopted what used to be called earmarks uh, and are now com called community projects. So I got one earmark for the University of Texas San Antonio because they have an excellent small business development program that actually works internationally as well. Uh, and so we got about $600,000 for them to create this initial class and it goes for three years of businesses to do this very thing, which is to prepare to bid with these public agencies. Now, I know in your conversation today, you're gonna to be talking not only about public and but also private procurement. I think that it's all important. I think that we should work on all of it. Let me tell you really quick though, why I picked local and public. First, uh, transparency. Uh, local uh, public agencies uh, have to be and are a lot more transparent than private companies. Uh, private companies can pick, as you all know, on a whim, uh, who they want to hire uh, for a particular service or purchase goods from, et cetera. Uh, that's not to say that there aren't rigorous processes in place so they get the best deal and all that, uh, but there also isn't much transparency often or not as much transparency in those private companies. So transparency. Uh, second, accountability. The city of San Antonio, for example, the city council, which is incredibly diverse, appoints the board members for CPS Energy. We have a, a, a municipally owned energy company in San Antonio. It's not unique around the country, but uh, it's, it's fairly unusual. We also have a, a municipally owned a water utility. So the council, a diverse council, appoints the board members. So it's easier for them to hold the CEOs and the boards accountable uh, because of that. So you have a mechanism for accountability that doesn't exist quite honestly in the same way on the private side. Uh, you know, so those were transparency and accountability and accessibility were the big three. By accessible, I mean, as you all know, I've been working on federal procurement as well. I've got some legislation to improve the transparency in the Department of Transportation, for example. But the federal government is huge. Uh, and quite honestly, is beyond the capacity of any single legislator uh, to really take on. And that requires a true ensemble effort. And while this has been an ensemble effort also, uh, I, I represent the main San Antonio uh, congressional district, about half of the city, and have also built a coalition of elected officials in Barrett County, in San Antonio, who are watching what these agencies do as well. Uh, in fact, we have our annual essay to DC, the Chamber of Commerce, bringing all the agencies up next week, and I'll get a chance to meet with each of them about their progress on all of these things. Uh, so those three things, uh, something that is accessible or manageable, uh, more transparent, uh, and also there's an accountability mechanism there, led me to go local and public. Uh, and we are making progress. Uh, the city manager is committed, the mayor, uh, the mayor has been great. Our mayor is Ron Nuremberg, uh, Asian American, and our county judge is Asian American, and both of them have committed to this. And so we're starting to make strides in San Antonio. It's still in its early phases. And quite honestly, in all of this realm, as you know, we face a headwind with anti-affirmative action efforts and anti-DEI efforts in places like Texas, Utah just passed a bill, and other states as well. Uh, but I still believe that this work is important, that it's achievable, and that it's meaningful to the communities that we represent. And that if we're going to help, help people uh, grow their businesses and prosper, because oftentimes securing contracts in the public sector is what gives somebody the credibility, the credentials, the experience to then go compete in the private sector. This is essential. I hope that you all will talk to your members of Congress, your elected officials at the state level and the local level about how important an issue this is. This is incredibly important to put money in the pockets through business of the people in the places that I represent, uh, in the place that I represent and the places that many members of Congress represent. Uh, and then finally, we're working in San Antonio to create a kind of template or model that can be taken to other cities uh, to do a similar thing. The Aspen Institute is also working with Bruce Katz and Drexel in El Paso, for example. Uh, and I know they've worked in a few other cities as well. Uh, but, and also to give you a sense of scale, 
these, these agencies that I just discussed, every year they bid out about $9 billion in contracts. So this is huge, important uh, money that we're talking about. We also have a lot of the money from the Inflation Reduction Act and the bipartisan infrastructure bill, federal money that's coming through the states and the local governments. We have to build up the capacity of our businesses to compete and to win contracts to benefit our communities. So I wanna say thank you all very much for hosting this conversation. Uh, thank you for advocating for small businesses, for making the playing field more level and competitive uh, and doing everything that you can to make sure people have a fair shot at public and private contracts. Thank you all so much. And feel free to reach out uh, whenever you think there's something that should be on our horizon as well. Well, thank you so much, Congressman. Thanks for making time. We know uh, there's a last minute tax package and a lot going on. So carving out uh, 15 minutes for this uh, group of small businesses means a lot. With that, we'll get moving along in the agenda. It is my pleasure to turn the conversation over to my partner in crime, an amazing leader and visionary, uh, the backbone of this research and this initiative, uh, someone who spends many a nights uh, staying awake to make it all work. So we couldn't do it without you. Uh, with that, for an overview of the research, uh, Tammy Halevi, Executive Director, Reimagine Main Street. Thank you so much, Rhett, for your kind uh, words. Wouldn't want to be um, doing this work with anyone other than you. Um, I am Tammy Halevi, as Rhett said. I'm the Executive Director of Reimagine Main Street, which is a project of the Public Private Strategies Institute. Wanted to give you a little bit of context um, about the survey findings uh, before we dive in. I think that everyone in this audience knows that contracting with the federal government and large corporations presents massive opportunities for diverse owned and small businesses. You heard it well from the congressman, but let me dimension it a bit. The federal government is the largest consumer of goods and services in the world. In fiscal year 2022, that looked like 690 billion in contracts. Major investments by both the public sector and the private sector as part of the Biden administration's Investing in America agenda are creating industries of the future and onshoring supply chains, resulting in additional opportunities for diverse and small firms. On the private side, corporations spend just over half at about 58% of their revenue on corporate contracts with suppliers. So clearly the opportunity is large. If we can go to the next slide, in order to understand the contracting experience of diverse and small businesses and their readiness to compete for contracts, Reimagine Main Street joined forces with the 14 organizations that you saw on the screen uh, before to field this national survey. Um, as you can see on this slide, the sample of businesses who responded is large and it's robust, more than 1,900 overall respondents. And in order to really understand what we were seeing in the data, we cut it into essentially four segments. The first are more than 1,400 small employers that, as you can see, uh, reflect diversity on a range of dimensions. Another segment that is uh, just over, uh, just under 500 businesses that generate at least a million in revenue. Many, uh, many of those businesses far more than a million, 50 million and higher. And then we looked at more than 400 businesses in the sample that compete in investing in America industries such as construction, high tech, manufacturing, and clean tech. So. The survey, if we go to the next slide, the survey is rich with nuggets. And given our time together this afternoon, I wanted to highlight just a few. Um, you can access the full survey report on the Reimagine Main Street website, reimaginemainstreet.org. But three takeaways that I think are particularly relevant this afternoon. The first is that, let us be clear, diverse owned and small businesses have the capacity for contracting. And they report that contracting in both the uh, public sector and the private sector is a critical part of business strategies. That said, they overwhelmingly report that they don't think the playing field is level for competition. 
Second thing I want to lift up is that nearly a third at 29% of the businesses in the survey compete in investing in America industries. Other small businesses that who responded to the survey told us that they are eager to learn more about those opportunities and that there is much work to be done to make sure that businesses understand where the full range of opportunities from the investments uh, on both the private side and the public side are available uh, from the Biden administration's Investing in America agenda. And finally, given, uh, given both of those things, Intentional engagement with small and diverse owned businesses and unbundling contracts are both imperative to level the playing field so that diverse owned businesses and small businesses can contribute to building robust and resilient supply chains and creating value for their companies, the partners with whom they contract, and the economy. Two quick, uh, two quick uh, deep dives. If you go to the next slide, please. As you can see, small employers don't think they're um, they're competing on a level playing field. 61% of uh, all small employers um, would say that they do not agree that they compete on a level playing field, going up to, uh, to more than three quarters of individuals who own businesses with a disability or LGBT, LGBTQ business owners. Um, last note before uh, I close out, if you go to the next slide, Intentional engagement with small and diverse businesses and unbundling contracts are imperative. As you can see here, business owners told us their three biggest challenges. Across the board in each segment of businesses, it's clear that awareness and access to opportunities are perceived as the biggest barriers. And these barriers can be addressed with purposeful strategies to engage. Contract size was the third biggest barrier, and unbundling contracts into more competitive chunks can also serve to de-risk contracting opportunities for the contracting organization. So the extraordinary lineup of experts you will hear from shortly have ideas on these issues and more, and I don't want you to wait any longer to hear from them. So let's get to it. Um, our first panel go to the next slide, we'll focus on corporate contracting. It is my great, great pleasure uh, to welcome to the virtual stage a dear friend and an extraordinary business leader leading the way on addressing so many of the issues that diverse suppliers need to compete successfully. That's Ted Archer, the executive director and global head of business diversity at JP Morgan Chase. Ted will be joined by three tireless and fearless business leaders, Romero Cavazos, the President and CEO of the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, Ying McGuire, the President and CEO of the National Minority Supplier Development Council, and Justin Nelson, the Co-Founder and President of the National LGBT Chamber of Commerce, or NGLCC. With that, over to you, Ted, and thank you all for being here. Terrific. Thank you so much, Tammy, for that warm introduction. I wanna thank you and the Reimagine Main Street team for organizing this conversation and for really driving so much new knowledge to our space. And as always, it's a pleasure to share some virtual space with Justin, Ramiro, and Ying, three extraordinary leaders that I think will provide some additional insights into corporate contracting today. Now, Tammy, as you mentioned, uh, I look after our supply diversity portfolio at JP Morgan Chase. JP Morgan Chase, is an institution that's been operating a supplier diversity program for more than 30 years. And as a large institution, we operate globally and spend time, engage suppliers, um, organize ways to support and grow those suppliers across many different regions, many different countries to the tune of billions of dollars each year and with thousands of suppliers, $2 billion of which annually goes to diverse and small businesses. So this is an incredibly important conversation that we're gonna have. So Ying, Ramiro, Justin, let's start by talking about the role of corporate contracting and fueling the growth of small and diverse businesses. In total, the value of contracting is immense. And as Tammy said earlier, about 58 cents for each dollar revenue that corporations make is paid to suppliers. And so with that in mind, each of you represents networks of diverse suppliers. Uh, let's start by 
evaluating from your perspectives what the value of corporate supplier diversity is. So Yang, let's start with you. Welcome to this conversation and let's talk about how your network and your organization supports certified minority-owned businesses. Well, thank you, Ted. Uh, thank you for being a great corporate member of NMSDC. And I read uh, uh, on Fortune Magazine the conversation your CEO had at Davos, and uh, I applaud his unwavering commitment uh, to, to di diversity and, and minority-owned businesses. And thank you for your partnership with NMSDC. So um, some of you may be new to NMSDC, as you know, NMSDC was created in 1972 as a direct result of President Nixon's executive order to address racial equity and started as a federal charter now where member organization were the longest business growth engine for systemically excluded communities of color, including Asian American, um, Black, Hispanic, and Native American community. And it's a more than uh, mob upward mobility in the supply chain. It's about correct the unequal wealth building opportunities. And uh, you and Tammy talked about the role of corporate contracting in fuel the growth of NMSDC certified MBEs. I'm going to make it very simple. Corporate supply diversity empower job creators and job givers for our country. And for your company, really creating and expanding your consumer base for, for JP Morgan Chase and many of our corporate members, it's that plain and simple. And so if you look at, you know, Fortune 500 company in 2022, they generated about $16 trillion. If you, you, you talk about 58 cents a dollar, that means they're spending nine trillions. And so if, if a minority population is 40% and it's gonna be, uh, become new majority, uh, of our society, what does forty percent of nine trillion look like, and how many jobs that we can create? And today, for NMSDC certified MBEs, uh, they contribute to about they generate about three hundred sixteen billion in annual revenue and and sustain one point eight million jobs in our economy. So I call them job creators, job givers. However, three hundred sixteen billion is only little over 1% of US GDP, given that minority community makes up 40% and projected to become the ma majority majority by 2045. And so we need to get to that 4.5 tri uh, 4 trillion uh, uh, or 9 trillion market share. So therefore, NMSDC, a couple of years ago, uh, we embarked a journey, March to 1 trillion, in NMSDC certified MBE annual revenue. We have a lot of work to do. Um, not only supply diversity, or we call it business diversity, it's good for the overall economy. It's also good for your company's bottom line. So we say growth for MBEs is growth for all. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Ying. And I'm gonna come back to you, so don't, don't go too far. Um, but let's let's move to you, Ariel. You you represent not only millions of Latino and Hispanic owned businesses across the US, but you also advocate for them. You're engaging them and guiding them to grow and to scale. How does corporate contracting and supply diversity fit into your engagement of these millions of businesses across the country? Ted, thank you again for uh, setting the example for corporate America through JP Morgan Chase. And I'm honored to be on here with you, Ying and, and, and Justin who I respect completely. Um, it, bottom line is corporate America, Fortune 500 companies do less than 1% in contracting with minority and women-owned businesses. It is unacceptable. Uh, there is no question that we need to work a plan and put a strategy that is more infective, effective to achieve the availability that exists in our Asian Black and Hispanic and LGBTQ and Native American communities. We are underachieving, but we're also, it's not a good economic formula for the future of the largest economy in the world. We produce 40% of the world's economic exchange. And ironically, a community such as ours, which is a younger community, more educated, more prepared, is being left out. The 
the the there is no level playing field at this point although efforts have been made uh, and that table uh, of that level playing field is tilted away from people that we represent. It is not a good economic formula. Uh, we also feel very strongly that uh, not only is it a bad economic formula, but we are the fastest growing consumers for the future uh, business opportunities in this nation. Two, we also are the workforce of the future has been proven out by data that this is where the workforce will come from. And then three, we also have 5 million Latino owned businesses, a GDP of $3.2 trillion, uh, and we are 20% of the population. In addition, we need more people of color um, and Asian and LGBTQ communities uh, to serve on these Fortune 500 corporate boards. That's where decisions are being made. So in my estimation, uh, although I'm an optimist, I wanted to share that presently uh, the marketplace is not achieving that success that will allow our economy to continue to fill the jobs that we need to do business with competitive firms, uh, to provide efficiencies, and also uh, the consumer growth that we're seeing in this is nation uh, needs to be an economic uh, two-way street. And right now, um, you know, the smart companies that are doing the procurement, doing what they're supposed to do, are the ones that will survive. There are some firms that still don't get it, are, are and those are the ones that are going to stay behind, and it's going to happen very quickly. So I'm honored to represent the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce with my colleagues on here. Obviously, we need to continue to fight for more capital, for capacity building, we need to do our part to be prepared and also clearly to go after contracts and procurement. Uh, as Tammy said earlier, the US government also needs to do its part. It's the largest buying service in the world. And so if we can couple the private sector with the public sector, we can create uh, the American dream for more people than we have today. No question about it, Romero. Uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, Justin, I want to get you in here. You know, NGLCC is the largest certifier of LGBT owned businesses. From your perspective, how important are supply diversity programs for your community of businesses and, and why? Well, thanks, Ted. And let me ring the bell for JP Morgan Chase as well on what uh, your CEO had to say. I think it really opened the door for others to be. Uh, continue to be champions of diversity initiatives that really are business imperatives. Uh, we represent the interests of the estimated 1.4 million LGBT owned companies that are in the United States with a combined economic impact of about $1.7 trillion. So the ability to contract with major corporations or in the private sector at large is incredibly important, not just for LGBT owned companies, but for diverse owned businesses across the board. And organizations like mine, like Ramiro's, Ying, WeBank, uh, Disability Inn, Naboba, uh, other organizations that represent diverse businesses, uh, it's incredibly important for us to be that conduit because it's not that these diverse businesses are necessarily being overtly overlooked, but they don't have access to even be able to compete. And so, you know, there's this myth out there that in the private sector, um, you know, we're mandating inclusion. We're not. This is a goals-based program. These are programs that are ensuring that there is access for the diverse uh, business America, soon to be the majority minority business America, has an ability to uh, compete on a level playing field. As you well know, in the private sector, businesses win their contracts based on quality of product and competitiveness of pricing, and our organizations help them do just that. I think it's also important to realize uh, how important having these programs are in the private sector. I think we all believe, of course, it's the right thing to do. It makes sense. It's bringing people in out of the shadows so that they have an opportunity. But it's a business imperative. And we have to remember that. We have to remind people of that. And we have to be championing that every single day. Uh, you know, for example, corporate partners year over year cost uh, on driving down cost savings is about eight and a half percent for companies that have a supplier diversity program. That's compared to about three to seven percent 
uh, for annual procurement savings that most organized uh, organizations realize. I think there's something really exciting to be said here too for the consumer side of things. You know, according to the Corporate Diversity Index, an increase in awareness of a brand supplier diversity program of just one percent will lead to an additional eight hundred thousand. Get that number: eight hundred thousand U.S. customers using the brand's products or services. So this is incredibly important. It's not just doing it for the sake of doing the right thing. Hey, I'm a social justice guy. I believe that. I'm also a business person. And the reality is these programs are important to the bottom line. Uh, these are red-blooded, tax-paying American firms that employ people. And their ability to be able to access contracts, compete on a level playing field is hugely important. And that's why we need to make sure that we continue to support these efforts in the private sector. And of course, uh, through government contracting, which we'll hear more about in the next panel. Thanks, Ted. Thank you, Justin. And I actually want to stay with you because I'm going to combine a couple of questions here for the sake of time. Uh, you raised a really important point around some of the misconceptions as it relates to supplier diversity, what it is and what it is not, uh, that it really is a, an initiative, a, a discipline, if you will, that helps to level the playing field, uh, that creates accountability for inclusion and focuses on business outcomes um, and business practices, good business practices lead to good business outcomes. From your perspective, and I'm going to go to to our other panelists as well on this question, what are some of the challenges you see in corporate supplier diversity and what sort of actionable guidance might you offer companies like ours um, or individuals who are seeking to promote and enhance corporate supplier diversity? I, I think probably one of the biggest, and, I, and you, you might be an exception here, but a lot of supplier diversity programs are under-resourced. And frankly, I think some of them are undervalued. Uh, the statistics that I just laid out there are important for folks to understand. This isn't, you know, charity work. These are valuable companies that can really add bottom line profit and value to a company and their supply chain. So I think changing that paradigm that it's somehow less than companies that participate in supplier diversity programs and really realizing that they're more nimble, they're more able, they're more quick to react. And they are able to compete and offer quality products at more competitive pricing. Those are sort of some of the things that we need to uh, think about. And then, quite frankly, the elephant in the room is people being uh, frightened by this uh, large vocal minority of uh, individuals uh, that are seeking to systematically, brick by brick, tear down initiatives uh, in that, that ensure every single one of us has a chance to participate in the American dream. So I think still, uh, holding steady. Uh, making sure that um, uh, these uh, statistics are reinforced, that supplier diversity is not just for feeling good, it's for the good of the business and the bottom line. I think those are probably some of the things I would underline, and I'll keep it short so my other uh, fellow panelists have an opportunity to talk. Excellent, excellent. Really, really insightful, Justin. Uh, Ying, I'm going to go to you on this one because you mentioned something that's quite relevant, which is the legacy that NMSCC has not only in promoting supplier inclusion and business inclusion, but the fact that it stems from public policy. We, we heard from Congressman Castro earlier just how important it is to look at the intersection of public policy, even government uh, contracting opportunities, and how that can propel opportunities into the private sector as well. But NMSSC is such an important catalyst for that. You sit at the intersection of that. What sort of challenges do you see from your perspective and what actionable guidance might you provide to companies who are interested in growing their programs or just individuals who want to extend and enhance supply diversity at large? Great, great question. And I agree with everything uh, my peer leader and my brother from different mother, Justin, just said uh, for the company's stay course in spite of the fiction and noise and legal threats out there, look at look at the economics and just adequately explained about, you know, if you supply diversity index raise 1%, there's additional 900,000 consumers for you. So focus on economic outcome uh, for, for the company. It's very important in, it, in this very challenging environment. The other thing is, as you know, you know, we are introducing a term that was introduced by University of Chicago under the leadership of John Rogers many decades ago called a business diversity. 
And this means expanding your supply diversity effort to include buying from every department from the very top of the organization into every line uh, business leaders. It means get buying from every budget holders, literally, meaning prioritize spending with diverse businesses, uh, MBEs, LGBTQ, dis people with disability, women in areas like often left out out of traditional supply diversity program, like who's managing your retirement plans? Who's your insurance brokers? Who does your legal services? Who's your manufacturing partners? And the other thing is earlier, Tammy talking about three key challenges through the survey. So the facts don't lie, right? So she talked about lack of a relationship, lack of awareness to opportunities. She talked about size and bundling. So the, the organization, large companies such as yours, on the one side, I understand you can't afford these zillions of resources to break the contract into very small one. But at the same time, you have a issue that um, some of the small diverse businesses, they need to have opportunity to start from somewhere. They can't just, you know, from day one, just $500 million contract. So we need to figure out very innovative ways to figure out how to do that. And one of the way to do it is look at emerging areas like, you know, AI is changing everything we're doing. So how can we get diverse businesses into the AI space, very specific opportunities, get them in early so they can scale, and then the second thing that, um, you know, do more of it, it's really looking at tier two spend, tier three spend, tier four spend, make sure all of your prime suppliers in the supply chain are held accountable and to ensure they're doing their job, whether they're diverse, non-diverse, they're doing their job to help smaller companies. Uh, to to be able to realize their American dreams. So I'm going to save some time from Romero. Romero, you, you get the last word. From your vantage, what are some of the opportunities to improve supplier diversity and to really boost growth opportunities for MBEs in your community? I think the best way, and we've seen it uh, done before when I was director of economic development with a large automotive manufacturer, and both uh, Justin and Ying have referenced it. It's uh, matching up tier one, tier two, and tier three suppliers with existing firms and making sure that the corporation buys into these important uh, aspirational goals or else we won't achieve them. And I've seen some of these firms and tier one suppliers also do business uh, in, uh, in Mexico who did business in the US in an important industry where there were few women and, and people that were uh, Hispanics, and and but it needs a a a fair broker. It needs uh, contracting leaders who have a bias for action, rather than see themselves as gatekeepers uh, to just fulfill DEI surface requirements, but actually are not making tangible uh, progress. And I know when we get to the next panel, we'll hear about some of the data from my colleague Ron Busby that while we're growing uh, the numbers, uh, the pie continues to say, stay the same size. We need to continue to grow the pie to feed everyone. Terrific. Uh, Ramiro, Justin, Ying, thank you so much for your insights. Uh, we're all now much more equipped to take action to make improvements for access to markets and to growing diverse businesses and small businesses and corporate supply chains. Looking forward to continuing our partnership and uh, Tammy, I will pass it back over to you. Thank you so much, Ted. Wow, what a fantastic conversation. Uh, please everyone join me in thanking Ted and Ramiro and Ying and Justin for their insights uh, and their tireless work. Um, as, uh, as you know, we will now turn our focus to government contracting. Uh, we could not have better leaders for this conversation. Um, please join me in welcoming first Sophie Sahaf from the White House, where she is the Director of Economic Justice on the Domestic Policy Council. Sophie is joined by three tireless advocates who lead large national networks of businesses. First, Ron Busby Sr., the President and CEO of U.S. Black Chambers, Inc. Second, Angela Dingle, the President and CEO of Women Impacting Public Policy, or WIP 
And last but certainly not least, Ling Tong, the president and CEO of National ACE. Sophie, panelists, welcome and thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me here to join you and help moderate this wonderful panel with my esteemed uh, colleagues here. So, and also just wanna thank uh, Reimagine Main Street for pulling this group together, but also this whole coalition of groups that put together this work to generate this data, this survey, because it's so valuable for all of us to better understand nuanced issues facing diverse owned businesses. That's such a critical priority for this administration. For this panel, we really want to dig into the role that government contracting plays in helping drive growth and drive creation and expansion for small, diverse owned businesses today. As Tammy mentioned earlier, but want to reiterate that the government is the biggest buyer in the world. We spend over $700 billion a year on a very wide range of goods and services from building the shuttles that go to space to consulting and IT services and just about everything in between. And in the first year of his term, the president made it a top equity and economic priority to grow the share of contracting that is going to small disadvantaged businesses by about 50%. And with the support of many of the leaders on this panel and beyond on this call and outside of this call, we have hit record spend for diverse owned businesses every year of this administration. And I just want to underscore that this is also an economic imperative because we want to draw in all the talent, all the ingenuity, the creativity, especially as we are trying to push forward a very ambitious investing in America agenda to drive forward an industrial strategy and build the new sectors of the future that Tammy also spoke to. And we don't want to leave any of that talent on the sidelines. We've done it before, and that's not something we um, that serves our country, our economy, or our communities. So this survey, very valuable, like I said, it highlights that about a third of respondents find government contracting is critical to business growth strategies. And Ron, I was hoping to start with you as the leader of the Black Chamber of Commerce. The survey also showed that half of the businesses that generate over a million dollar in revenue see government contracting as a critical part of their growth strategy and really would love to hear from you. Help us understand you're close to the ground. You're working day in and day out with these businesses. Why that's so true, why the government contracting is so critical and how your organization's really helping to effectively bring those businesses into the government fold. Thank you so much, Sophie, for the opportunity to be here. And thank you, Brett and Public Private Strategies for convening this call. I think the timing of this is extremely important because we are hearing a, a lot of conversations about the attack on affirmative action, what's happening in reference to minority owned businesses. And so, to speak on behalf of the 380,000 black owned businesses that are members of our local chambers, we represent 171 chambers across the country. It is our honor to really give updates on what's happening in reference to black owned businesses. Uh, as a former black owned business, I also understand the value that government contracting has. Uh, we heard a great deal about the power that the federal government has uh, in reference to contracting and spend, but so many of our businesses across the country uh, have never had the opportunity to hear or engage with the federal government, with the federal contracting opportunity. And so this is a good news conversation to be having. Uh, as we sit here in Washington, D.C., there are great programs that are being created, but they very seldom reach the communities that we live in, that we operate our businesses and that we home in. And so we were fortunate to be able to participate in the SBA's Community Navigator Pilot Program which really mandated that the organizations that participated went out, regardless of what the business's affiliation, Democrat, Republican, Black, White, it was our objective to go find those small businesses and inform them of the opportunities, the technical assistance, as well as the capital for businesses to start and grow. And can I say that this morning, we just recently heard from the SBA on the spin, and Black firms were uh, actually received $500 million in additional contract spend over 2022, over 2021. So it has been working. Uh, we also heard a great deal about businesses starting and how to get engaged. And so many firms find that doing business with the federal government, although it is very difficult, it is time consuming, 
it mandates that you understand your business model, that you really understand who you are, what you bring to the table. And with that, you're now able to grow your business from the public sector to also eventually doing business with the private sector as well. And so for black firms across the country, uh, we see the federal government as a place to start, to not just start, but to also grow and expand. The great thing about the SBA's 8A program is that it allows you to, business, to do business across the United States. So you may be headquartered in Washington, D.C. and still have the opportunity to compete for opportunities in California or Florida. Many small businesses and minority businesses don't get to do business outside of their communities. And so the federal government has allowed uh, those types of opportunities to be created. And so for that, we're looking forward to taking advantage. Some of the challenges that our firms are having is that when doing business with the federal government, you can get a contract January 1st and may not get paid until July 15th. And so it is imperative that we look at access to capital. The U.S. Black Chamber is now partners with an organization called Lendistry, which is one of the largest SBA lenders in the country. Office also happens to be a black owned firm to make sure that now, regardless of where you're located across the country, you can get the access to capital that you need to start, grow and sustain your business. And when we do more matchmaking, it's on us to now go to the federal government and say, hey, there are contracts that are coming up in 2024 fourth quarter or first or second quarter of 2025. It is the leaders of organizations like the ones that are on this call today to make sure that we're carrying the torch for our members and for those minority businesses that may not have those relationships in which we've been speaking about to carry that information for them. And so when you have organizations like the U.S. Black Chamber that has relationships with the Department of Defense and Department of Energy and the other agencies here, we can carry that information. We can be those salespeople for those companies that may not necessarily have a footprint or a voice here in Washington, D.C. And so when we collectively work together, our businesses and our communities prosper as well. Thank you for that, Ron. And it very much is a partnership. The Community Navigator Program is a great example where your organization, many others, National Urban League and others, help businesses figure out how to navigate and access the government opportunities like the 8A program that help businesses figure out how to get into the contracting game. And um, so that is uh, an it is a it, it we work better when we work together to get uh, drive towards these goals. I would love to hear from you, Chilling, a little bit about the work you all are doing at the your network with Asian American Pacific Islander owned businesses. They're also very active in government contracts. And we saw that with the recent data that we published through SBA last week about one in five of investing in America businesses, if you will, in the sample from this survey are owned by Asian American Pacific Islanders and are competing in sectors like construction, advanced manufacturing, clean energy, others that are really important to the competitiveness of our country and our econ uh, economic growth. Would love to hear how you see contract opportunities in these sectors um, and the importance for your communities and the businesses that you're working with most closely day to day. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank PPS to host this panel with such a meaningful discussion. And also, I'm so honored to be with Ron and Angela. I admire them greatly because they have done so much for our community. National Aids represent 2.9 million AAPI business owners who employ 5 million people. Currently, we have worked closely with our 120 affiliate chambers to help AAPI business grow. Thank you so much for asking, you know, you mentioned about one in five of the investing in America business in, in the sample uh, are AAPI owners. AAPIs have the entrepreneurship in their mind. They are one of the highest of entrepreneurship rate in the country. You, have, you will hear, you know, you or you have heard many stories that the people came to this country uh, as in some of the new immigrants, they have nothing, but they build their empire. I just want to highlight uh, some of you, uh, probably you already know, like a Yahoo, Jerry Young, YouTube, Stephen Chen, 
Zoom Eric Chu Young, and also DoorDash Tony Shi. So, however, they are still facing challenges than other minority uh, community, such as the uh, contracting opportunities. Uh, Asian Americans have the highest rates of limited English proficiency at 35% and are frequently out of the loop when it comes to various contracting opportunities. You, you know, based on the survey, a lot of them, they are not aware of the opportunity and especially they do not know how to build a relationship with government. So the federal investment in infrastructure, semiconductors and clean energy are open up significant and historical opportunities for our and the minority community when it comes to contracting. Uh, they still have a challenge as, as Ron has mentioned, but we want to work overcome all those barriers together. So for those uh, industry that uh, AAPI entrepreneurs and innovators are very active in, and they stand to benefit and grow from the federal investment, especially in semiconductors and clean energy right now. Uh, we, so I think uh, we are um, significant as a consumer. Uh, our community probably expect to reach $1.6 trillion this year as uh, our buying power. But also, I really want to encourage our um, AAPI community as a producers, because we just want to make sure they are not left out this contracting opportunities. And we know that and our entrepreneurs with right opportunities, resources, direction and information can achieve incredible things. That's really wonderful um, for you to have shared all of that um, and couldn't agree more that there are so many opportunities and we want all the communities to be looking for opportunities to work with the government and appreciate the role you play in helping a broker um, and share that information and, and spread the spread the gospel, if you will. So I would love to turn to you, Angela. Uh, you are leading, of course, the organization really focusing on bringing women more into the fold in the small business world. And from this survey, we saw that three out of four women own small business employers in the survey said that government contracting is critical for their growth strategy as well. Um, or rather, yes, it was 37% said that describe government contracting was critical. So as you lead your organization, you're advocating for these women business owners, supporting them. I would love to hear how you see the role of government contracting is critical to their businesses and what you see is most effective to helping bring those businesses into government contracting, helping them newly access government contracts or access more government contracts once they've gotten their foot in the door. We'll turn it to you, Angela. Thank you so much, Sophie. And it is an honor and a pleasure to be here on this panel with so many of my colleagues. You all are doing amazing work. Thanks to the Reimagine Main Street team and the other 14 organizations that partnered to produce this research. When we have this kind of data, organizations like ours can make informed decisions about how best to help the constituents and members of our organizations. So I am the CEO of Women Impacting Public Policy and we're one of the largest nonpartisan organizations in the country that advocates on behalf of America's 14 million women-owned businesses. Our top policy priorities center around creating more opportunities for women-owned businesses to participate in federal contracting. And we do that through advocating and through education. When you think about women business owners, the impact that they make on the economy is undeniable. Women own over 14 million businesses representing 39.1% of all the businesses in the United States. They employ over 12 million people and they generate $2.7 trillion. So women business owners have the potential to generate billions, if not trillions of additional revenue. And it's not just a statistic, it's a narrative about the contributions and the potential of women owned businesses to generate growth, to create jobs and to meet the needs of not only government buyers, but corporate buyers as well. And so government contracting really can serve as a critical component and a game changer for women business owners. You know, when we look at the report, we, we know that the certification process can be a little challenging. Regulatory requirements like cybersecurity and 
simply uh, learning all the terms and conditions that one has to understand and all of the acronyms when you're doing business with the government, it's still good. It's a good target market for women business owners. And so when we talk about what women business owners need, uh, each year WIP partners with the Small Business Administration and American Express to deliver a program called Challenge Her. It's a national initiative to boost government contracting opportunities for women-owned small businesses. And it has a special focus on the Women-Owned Small Business Federal Contracting Program. Now we started it in 2013. We've served over 26,000 business owners and it's a much sought after program for the reasons that you just talked about. So you talked about new entrants and about people who may have some experience working in this. Through this program, we're, we're seeking to address some of the barriers that were identified in this research. Awareness of the opportunities, building relationships that are necessary to pursue those government contracts, and finding partners that you can, uh, finding organizations that you can partner with so that you can compete on contracts that have been bundled. You know, uh, uh, category management makes a whole lot of sense from a taxpayer standpoint. I'm a taxpayer, I understand. But the, you know, what, what Tammy shared earlier and what the report tells us is that is a barrier to entry for women-owned businesses and diverse-owned businesses. And so when you can unbundle those, it gives them an opportunity to be able to compete. Uh, when it comes to women, women are is, is the one segment of that report that does report that access to capital is an issue for them. Uh, you need capital to be able to uh, hire the people that are going to work on the contract. Once you uh, get that contract, you may need capital for mobilization and some other things. So access to those procurement opportunities, access to capital, and the resources that are necessary to make sure that you're in the room when those things are being discussed is going to be important. We had quite a success last year. Our partners over at the Department of Education are in the process of releasing a multiple award contract with a set aside for women-owned businesses that was built around technology. And that was a partnership between the Oscar Blues and leaders at the Department mm -hmm. of Education, the Chief Information Office, and the Small Business Administration to create that. So I think that uh, the, 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 op the opportunity for women business owners and government contracting is huge. Thank you. That's fantastic. And uh, you might all be aware that last week we released some um, new guidance related to category management and multiple award contracts, trying to find more and more ways that we can expand access for all the businesses. Before I turn it back to Tammy, I just want to see if there's one thing in a sort of quick round that you would each share. Is, you know, we hit some records on the share of federal dollars going to small disadvantaged businesses, but there's, of course, more work left to be done. What's the one thing? practical, actionable as can be that you would highlight for policymakers to be thinking about um, to continue to drive forward towards our common goals. And Angela, I'll start with you. Just go backwards. Angela, chilling, and then run, and then we'll go back to Tammy. Thank you so much. So last week, the uh, National Women's Business Council released their 2023 annual report. And if you're familiar, you know it includes some policy recommendations. And in this instance, some of those recommendations were specific to government contracting. And so I will reiterate what we see in that report, and that's for the uh, for for the White House and Congress to adequately resource the SBA's Woman Owned Small Business Certification Program. It's a great program. They've done some work over the years to simplify the certification process and provide support for women business owners. But there's much more that needs to be done. And that can only be done without adequate funding. And while you're adding funding, just make it an actual baseline of 5% for the Women on Small Business Program. And then let's work on our uh, new minimum of 7%. Fantastic. Chilling? Yes. Uh, National AIDS is conducting our capital readiness program through funding from the Minority Business Development Agency, U.S. Department of Commerce. And one big part of our program is connecting diverse small business including AAPI entrepreneurs to capital and contracting market. So I wish people, if you are interested, please join us, www.nationalace.org. And Ron, close us out. Your thing, um, we say here, in order for there to be a great America, there must be a great black America. And in order for there to be a great black America, there must be great black businesses. And in order for there to be great black businesses, we need help. We need the administration's help. Uh, we need corporate America's help. And we need consumers to help. 
for our black owned businesses, as well as corporate America that is looking and listening, go to BY, B L A C K dot US. It is a by black certification for black owned businesses free of charge so that you can be found. We are going to be talking more about joint ventures, consortiums, and mergers and acquisitions as we move forward through 2024 and 2025 so that we can remove two of the obstacles that we hear on a day-to-day -day basis. One, we can't find them, Ron, and two, they don't have the size and scale. By using the Buy Black directory, you can find them, and by us coming together, we can create the size and the scale that we need to be able to successfully complete as well as be awarded the contracts that are being awarded across the country. Thank you so much for having us and we look forward to continuing this conversation, both with the corporate America, as well as the private and uh, public sector that we are discussing this afternoon. Wonderful, we see Director Tannen's here. So I'm gonna pass it over to Tammy. Thank you, great deep gratitude to all of you. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Ron, Shiling, and Angela, sharing your perspectives, and more importantly, the really important work that you all do for business owners and the economy. It is so important to see the strategic vision and hard work of the Biden administration to level the playing field by advancing transparency, ensuring access to opportunities for small and diverse owned businesses from the Investing in America investments, uh, and the usual business of government. It is now my great, great pleasure to welcome one of the architects of the Biden administration's approach to doing all of this, to ensure that diverse and small businesses are competing on a more level playing field, advisor to the president and director of the Domestic Policy Council in the White House, uh, Director Neera Tandon. Director Tandon, thank you so much for being here in the midst of your busy schedule. Welcome. Great, great to be with you. I'm. Uh... I'm managing both um, a phone and a video link, so everyone, uh, bear with me. Um, I'm. Uh, I really wanted to just come by to demonstrate uh, and discuss our commitment and our laser focus on advancing access to federal contracts and leveling the playing field for businesses from underserved communities. That includes minority-owned businesses, and particularly in this moment of threats. We really, I did really want to come here and talk with you about why this is a, a really a critical goal for us. In 2021, the administration committed to increasing the share of federal government purchases, purchases from small disadvantaged businesses to 15% in 2025. I know everyone knows that, but since setting that goal, we had a historic high of buying nearly $70 billion in goods and services from small disadvantaged businesses. That's 10 billion more than from the prior year that the goal was set. So we recognize and have acted with an understanding that capital access has been a priority. We also know that there are many challenges uh, for minority and underserved communities and for particularly for businesses. And we appreciate the work that many of your organizations have been doing to address this. That's why we've invested $12 billion in community lenders like community development, financial institutions, CDFIs, as we, as we all know them. This investment is bringing more dollars to underserved and minority communities, including Black and Latino communities. These investments are estimated to result in nearly $80 billion in increase, an $80 billion increase in lending for Black communities and a $50 billion increase for Latino communities. Moreover, this administration has improved the Small Business Administration's flagship loan guarantee programs to expand the availability of small dollar loans to underserved communities. Since 2020, the number of SBA loan back loans to Black owned businesses have more than doubled, more than doubled, while those to Latino entrepreneurs increased by more than 80%. And these actions have already shown real results. Under the administration, Black business ownership is growing at a fast at the fastest pace in 30 years, and Latino business ownership is growing at the fastest pace in over a decade, faster than any demographic in the country. So we're really proud of those results, but we know so much needs to happen. I think really integral to that is an understanding that our work for minority-owned businesses is really about equity, but also it's central to our economic growth strategy. Um, and we know that, you know, we're facing significant attacks, but we uh, won't back down in the face of those attacks. And we, we understand that these, 
these tools are real ways to build wealth in the black community and amongst uh, communities of color. And that is particularly important uh, right now where we have seen a long-term and systemic racial wealth gap. That is why, again, this action is so important and why the president and vice president are just so sure that we keep at, in this fight. So we know that um, we have longstanding challenges and we need to ensure that we don't allow these attacks to mean that we turn back the clock and erase the hard fought gains that have been made. So we know that we're in an inflection point, but we are communicating across agencies that this is not a moment to stand down, that there are ways that we need to manage the litigation that we're in, but it is not a reason to stand uh, to stand back or pull back from our obligation to ensure that the federal government is truly providing uh, equity across the board. And the truth is that the federal government has been um, an engine of economic immobility. It has, it has ensured from its actions that communities of color are not at the table. And it's really vital that we make up for those historic wrongs. We know we can't do this alone. We need all of you, including the private sector, to stand strong in continuing your work to advance equity and to stand up against these attacks. And it's great to see a growing list of companies standing up to support efforts, to advance diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. And we know, it, it, we know that there are a lot of people anxious out there, and we, uh, will, we are getting out the message and continue to get out the message that diversity is the strength of our country. Uh, ensuring true equity is uh, part of our future and that we are working hard. And we know it's critical that federal leadership synchronize federal government activities within the private sector and philanthropy so that we can have a force multiplier for change. So uh, I'm pleased to be with you uh, and really grateful for the work that we are doing together I'm really grateful for the leadership of Reimagining Main Street, but also all the work we do together to ensure that we have an economy that works for everyone and an economy that is built from the middle out, an economy that pulls everyone up, not just a few, um, and in an economy in which every single person can experience real opportunity, not just stated opportunity, but real opportunity and take part in the economic uh, growth that uh, the country is experiencing. And with that, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Director Tandon. We appreciate your willingness to participate in such a timely conversation. Uh, my name is James West. I am the Network Manager for Reimagine Main Street. Um, I also wanna thank Congressman Castro and our excellent moderators and speakers for joining us today. Uh, this work would have not would not have been possible without our 14 survey partners. So thanks to you all. And we look forward to continuing this important work together. Finally, thanks to everyone for attending today's convening. You can find the full survey results and the video from today's sessions on our website, www.reimaginemainstreet.org. Once again, that's www.reimaginemainstreet.org. Have a great afternoon and thank you for attending.